voice to our King. Dana, take us there. There's a name that left 
those mountains It comes our highways through the sea And I've seen his power unravel battles Right in front of me There's a face that stands defiant Shackles right off my feet That's the power of the name of Jesus Come on And that's the power of your name Just a mention makes a way Giants fall and strongholds break There is healing And that's the power that I claim It's the sin that rolled the grave Courage in the furnace of the flame, and that kind of daring expectation that every prayer I make, come on, is on an empty grave. That's the power of your name, just a mission makes a way. You 
trust Him more. Sing, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Oh, for grace to trust Him more. Thank you, God. We trust you, Jesus. You are our King. And you've given us hope. today church Jesus Christ our living hope thank you God who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the God of ages step down from Spoken, I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me His own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living home. Come on, you know it.
Come on. Come on. I love that line, my, my living hope. It's not just a hope that we have, it's a hope that's alive. It's a hope that's animated. That means it's not just something that happened a long time ago. It permeates every part of our present. It goes with us into the future. It's a hope that isn't stagnant. It it, it moves into every situation, every relationship, every problem that you're facing. This hope comes into that space and the words of that song really say, this hope is a person. Jesus Christ is our living hope. He has paid the price for us. He was buried and now he's alive so that we can be alive too. Where does that hope come from? We didn't earn that. We don't deserve that. That's what Paul's been talking about in the book of Ephesians that we've been looking at. In fact, just last week, Pastor Witt was talking about Ephesians, the second chapter. I just want you to look at this with me. I'm gonna read it. You you just look at this. It'll be here on the screen. In those days, we were living apart from Christ. We were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel and we, did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. We lived in this world without God and without hope. But now we have been united with Christ Jesus. Once we were far away from God, but now we have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. Isn't that good news? That's great news. So in order to kind of close out this time of our worship, our thanksgiving to God, I want us to read two more verses out of that same chapter, and I want us to read them together. I want you to say these words out loud. I want this to be your declaration as we close this time of worship, okay? Let's put those up there. You say this with me. Now, all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. So now we Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. We are citizens along with all of God's holy people. We are members of God's family, amen? Let's celebrate that this morning. Praise God. We didn't earn it, but he paid the price for us. And thank you so much for singing with us, for reciting scripture with us. In fact, before you sit down, turn around, welcome somebody to church. Let them know you're glad they're here. And then you can go ahead and have a seat. Well, good morning, good morning. So good to see all of you. Those of you here in the room, those of you who may be watching online, we are glad that you're here. My name's Lee. I'm up here with Priscilla. One of the things that we love to do is welcome you if maybe you're new. Maybe it's your first time to join with us here. Maybe it's your first time to watch online. Maybe some of you are in the room, you just moved into town. You're checking out churches and you decided to come check out churches with me. We're glad. Maybe you had a friend that invited you. Maybe they've been inviting you for a while and you just said, okay, this weekend I'm gonna go. Hey, listen. We're so thrilled that you're here. In fact, we've got something for you. Just take your phone out right now. If you're new, take your phone out. Just send us a text message. Our number is 23101. And just put there in the line the word new. We wanna send you a gift card. We want you to go get a little treat this week on us. Just our way of saying we're really glad that you came and we'd love to have you come back. We would. I actually just met Braden and Alex in the lobbies. It's their first time today. Yeah. They're really cool. I'm excited that you're here. Hey, maybe you've been coming for a while and you kind of like it here and you're wondering what's the next step for me. And if you're anything like me, you want to be a part of a church family where you feel like you belong. So we want to invite you to a monthly gathering that we do called The Next Move. We have so much fun getting together with you. We share a meal together. Yeah. But literally our entire team is in there along with our lead pastor, Whit George. And we love getting to meet you. And one of the cool things we ask in the room is, okay, who has been here less than six months, more than five years? Yeah. Almost always half the room stands up for less than six months, the other half more than five years. So here's what I would say to that. It's never too soon or never too late right. to get involved. So be a part of that with us. Just text NEXT to 23101 and join us for the gathering happening at the end of this month. That's right. We'd love to see it next move. And maybe some of you have done that. And you're like, okay, they told me what my first step was, next move, what do I do now? Here, I I said this the last three weeks, I just wanna say it again. Around here we are convinced that God develops us and grows us and demonstrates his love to us most and best in the context of family. 
And in the fall here at Church on the Move, we launch a lot of new groups, places where you can get connected to other people, build real relationships, have people that can walk with you through difficulties in life, people that can celebrate your victories and help you succeed. We want you to be a part of that. You can just go to cotm.info and you can see all of our different groups. We've got groups happening all over the city and we've got mid-sized groups that happen right here uh, on, on Wednesday nights at our building. And there's child care for those. There's food. If you're coming straight from work, you can purchase food at a really reasonable price if you come. We got a couple of really big groups. Our, our Exodus Bible study just kept growing last week. It was amazing. I think they got like 130 people meeting over here in the fellowship hall for Exodus Bible study. There was only one group that actually was bigger than the Exodus Bible study. And that's the what are you laughing about? That is the Brotherhood Father by God. We got 160 guys signed up for this. But guess what? They're still, come on, thank you. I Four see you clapping people. for me, thank you. That's great. Casey's not here for me to rub it in, but that's a, don't worry, I'm gonna take care of it. Um, listen, there's still room for you. Even though some of those groups started this past Wednesday, our group starts this Wednesday. Listen, there's still room for you. You may have meant to do it and you forgot. It's okay, you're only missing one week jump in. It really doesn't matter. Exodus, our women's study, our purpose studies, doesn't matter. Just, just jump in and get connected to community. We also had a breakfast for, for Brotherhood this, this last Friday. 400 guys showed up connecting together. It's a great first step and it's a great place to invite friends. The first Friday of every month we meet for a breakfast, but there's some, there's some daughter stuff going on too. There is. You guys are actually the reason why the hallways still smell like bacon, but it's time for the ladies You're of the welcome. church to, yeah, thank you for that. It's time for us to have fun too, ladies, though. We have actually a brunch coming up on yeah. September 17th that we want to invite you to be a part of. We're bringing in a special guest speaker, but here's what's cool about the Brotherhood Breakfast and the Daughters Brunch. Those are easy invite opportunities for you to bring someone with you that maybe has never been a part of a community like that. Maybe they're hesitant to come to church for the first time, but they would want to come eat with you. So why don't you get signed up for that and invite someone to come with you. You can do that at cotm.info and join us for that. That's right. You know, in the book of Psalms, it says the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Then it goes on to say, not just the stuff in the world, but even us, we were created by God, we are His. And so we take time in all of our services. Part of our act of worship and obedience is to give. In fact, there's a lot of you in this room, you've decided to trust God with your resources because God cares about every area, every aspect of our life. And because you've done that, because you've been obedient and you've trusted God, we're able to do things like mid-sized groups and kids ministry and student ministry and brothers and brotherhood and daughters. We're able to make an impact in our city and so we thank you for that. But maybe some of you haven't taken that step. That's one area of your life that you're just not sure about. You know, God says in scripture, he says, test me in this area. See if I won't take care of your needs when you trust me with all that you have. We would encourage you to join us in this. We do it cheerfully because we know that God blesses us and the world around us whenever we're generous with what we have. We got a couple of different ways that we give around here. You can just text the word give to that same number, 23101, and you'll get instructions there on how you can give electronically. It's pretty easy to do. If you came prepared to give in the room with cash or check, that's great too. We have drop boxes at all of our exits. You can just drop that in on your way out. Now, we've been up here long enough because what everybody is excited about this morning is the fact that we have our founding pastor, Pastor Willie George is in the house, right? And maybe you're new and you're like, why is that a big deal? Because every time Pastor Willie George is here, he brings us a powerful word from God's holy scriptures. And he's doing that today out of Ephesians, the third chapter. Get your notebook and your pen and your Bible ready on your lap because you're going to be blessed by what Pastor George has to say. So before we move into that time, Priscilla, would you just pray over this moment of giving? I would love to. Heavenly Father, we love you. What a privilege it is to gather with our church family to worship you. And as we give of our time and our resources to you right now, Lord, we thank you and are expectant to hear from you today. We give you the glory for what's to come, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.
Good morning. Good to see you. We want to welcome all you here in the auditorium. Everybody out at Eddie Warrior, Dick Connor, good to have you as well. This message is really dear to me because it changed my life. It's something that I discovered really a long, long time ago. And uh, it's one of the most important spiritual principles anybody will ever master or to get. I say master. I don't know you ever master everything in Scripture, but, but something that you have to make a part of your belief system. And I'm talking about Ephesians chapter 3. Now, we've started with Ephesians 1, which is a tremendous revelation of what God did for us. And we pray for understanding so we can grasp it. You have to have his help to understand. You can't do it with your own intellect. It takes a revelation of the Holy Spirit in order for you to really grasp everything he did for you. And then it's important to understand how that you are seated with Christ, raised with him, that you have a position of authority. But now we're going to talk about a different element. And I'm going to give you three M's this morning. And remember each one of them in sequence because they'll help you to understand how God works. Here's the first one. It is God's manner to work through human beings. Now, nobody would probably argue with that. Everybody would probably say, well, I agree with that. that you, you see that God works through people, but we don't fully get it sometimes. It is his manner to work through human beings. And I want to show you how complete that commitment of God is, that God doesn't just say that. He has committed to it to the point that if humans don't do their work, then there are certain things that he cannot do. So let me read to you from the book of Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 36. Let all the house of Israel therefore know. Who's talking? The apostle Peter. When's he talking? On the day of Pentecost. Who's listening? Thousands of Jewish people who were aware of the fact that Jesus had been crucified. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now here's what I want you to see. This cutting to the heart, that's a word called conviction. It means that you come to a realization that you're in trouble with God. And before you can be saved, you have to recognize that you're a sinner, that you need help. There are a lot of people who don't recognize that. And the only way that that realization comes to you is through someone preaching to you and proclaiming the truth of God's word. You do not come to that on yourself. Nobody ever wakes up some morning and say, I'm going to get saved today. I'm going to repent of my sins today. You won't even think about it. The Bible tells us in the book of Romans, there is nobody who seeks after God. We say this all the time, I found the Lord. No, you didn't. He found you. He came looking for you. Thank God you had enough sense to turn. But you don't find God just because you decide you're going to find God. That never happens with anybody. They have to be confronted first with the truth of God's Word, and that's what happens here. Now, I want you to look at this. Paul goes on to elaborate on this. Peter demonstrates it on the day of Pentecost when 3,000 people came to faith. But this is what Paul said. But how are they to call on him in whom they've not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? And how are they going to hear without someone preaching? Now, let me just say this, that this whole business of people being saved, it had to be, first of all, worked through Jesus. He had to die on the cross, be raised from the dead. But after that, there have to be people who tell it, who preach it, who proclaim it. Nobody comes to Christ, even though Christ died and rose again. You have to hear the preaching. So the follow-up, the activity that brings people to faith in what Jesus did has been given to us. It's called, in 2 Corinthians 5, 19, the ministry of reconciliation. We have been given this charge. Angels can't do it. 
Angels will be able to do it at some time in the future in the great tribulation period, but not now. You know, it has been committed to men. Now, somebody would say, well, I hear these stories about Jesus appearing to people in Iran, and they have no freedom to preach the gospel there. And Jesus appears to people from time to time, and they have dreams, they see the Lord, and and they come to faith. That's right, because he's a man. He's not an angel. So he can appear anywhere he wants to and preach legally because he's a man. He has physical body. He is a human, and the gospel has been committed to humans. So it's okay if he does it. But angels don't preach. The angel that came to Cornelius said, you have to go down to Joppa. Find a man named Peter. He will tell you what to do. He didn't even say saved. He didn't even say salvation. Didn't even mention the word. He will tell you what you need to do because this ministry has been committed to people, to humans. God's manner is to work through people. And you see this all through the Old Testament. God could have done a number of things by himself without people, but he didn't. He chose to work through people. Great story in 1 Samuel chapter 17. You've heard it since you were a kid. David and Goliath. It's so commonly talked that it's a part of our culture. We talk about those David and Goliath things. I never dreamed I would see this, but last year when the Jinx Elementary team came to play Lincoln's Elementary They put on their website, it's David versus Goliath. Only they were calling us Goliath, and they're the David. I never thought I would see that day, but it happened. Anyway, little side note. All right. Goliath came and cursed the people of God and cursed their armies. And he did it for 40 days, twice a day, 80 different times. He stood up and ran his mouth. Now, let me ask you this. Don't you think that God had the power to zap him? on the spot with a, just doesn't even have to have a full-blown fist to do it. Just a little power out of his little finger, and Goliath is gone. God doesn't do it. Why doesn't God do it? Because God works through people. And so God wants to deal with Goliath through people. And so he sends David. David doesn't even know he's going to fight the giant. He shows up to deliver food to his brothers. But when he hears the giant, something comes over him, and he realizes God's going to use me to deal with this giant. Let me read it to you. 1 Samuel 17, 46. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down, and I will cut off your head. Now, this is interesting because it's exactly how God spoke to the serpent in the Garden of Eden. He said, I will bruise your head, Genesis 3.15. When God wants to deal with the devil, he doesn't just chop off a finger or a toe. He goes for the head. And that's what David said. I'm going to take your head off. He works through the hands of people. In other words, God is saying, I'm not going to do this apart from my people. I will do this through the people that I've anointed and raised up. I'm going to work through them. You see, we have these ideas that God ought to work out there. God, work out there. Do your thing, God. And here's one of the stupidest prayers that people ever pray. Lord, send your spirit. Somebody said, stupid? Absolutely. He's already sent the Spirit. And if the Spirit was going to work, he's going to work through us. Isaiah didn't pray, Lord, send the Spirit. He saw the Lord, and he knew there was a mission that needed to be accomplished. And what did he say? He said, here, my Lord, send me. Because he knows God uses people. In other words, if it's going to get done, he's going to use us. This notion that somehow God is going to do great things without his people is a crazy notion. He has given his spirit to us to flow through us so he can work through us. David said, God's going to use this, my hand. God said to Goliath, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. It's my hand that's going to do this. That's how God works. See, we wouldn't say that. We'd say, oh, God, you move in the way you want. God wants to use you, and he wants to use your hand. All right. 
Now, 1 Samuel 17, 46 and 47. David went on to say that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Stop. Most people today would write and they would say that there is a God for Israel. But that's not the word that he uses. He uses in Israel, meaning that God is doing his thing in people, not just over here, separate from them, working for them. He is working through them. He is in them. Do you see the difference? It's subtle, I know, but it's very important because what happens is we give up our position of being used by God when we begin to think that God does everything apart from us, and he doesn't. He works through us. Listen to what he said. He said that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. God's going to use your hand. This continues in the New Testament. Jesus said, these signs will follow them that believe. O Lord, stretch forth your hand. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. We were privileged. A lot of you are too young to remember, maybe don't know it, but Tulsa was privileged to be the home of perhaps the greatest missionary evangelist of the 20th century, the great T.L. Osborne. In one campaign alone in Kenya, where he had these massive rallies where thousands and thousands came to faith in Christ, and thousands and thousands of people were healed, there were 600 churches started from just one meeting. He had similar results in Indonesia, India, crowds so huge, he said, people would ask him, do you go to the soccer stadiums? He said, absolutely not, they're too small. He said, we go to massive fields and set up platforms. He said, if you were to be able to stand in front of the speakers, they'd blow your eardrums out. He said, we don't want the limitation of a stadium because it's way too small. Millions of people would come to these meetings. I say millions, tens of thousands would come. And so... He had a burden for the country of Uganda. Now, for those of you who studied a little, little history, there was a dictator in Uganda, a terrible, terrible man named Idi Amin, and he ravaged his own country. There was a civil war. He was run out of the country, and it was impossible to fly into Uganda because the airport had craters in the runways, and you couldn't land a plane. The water system did not work so even if you went to the nice hotel, you couldn't flush a toilet or turn on a faucet because the water was destroyed. And all over Uganda, people were walking without all of their limbs. They had been so hit by the terrible landmines, and they were missing arms and legs. And it was in this place that God put into the heart of T.L. Osborne to go and to preach. He had to land in Kenya. So he went to Kenya and he rented the trucks and the sound system and all of the things it would take to do a massive rally in Uganda. And they went over the border. And there was no way to advertise, no magazines, no newspapers, no television. He just had to start. And in the beginning, he started with just a handful of people. But the word began to spread. And you could see people coming from great distances day after day, limping, coming on crutches, coming with uh, all the terrible things that had happened to them. And soon, there were tens of thousands of people lined up at night hearing the word of God. He said, I was in the hotel room, I had my chair turned against the wall, and I was in prayer one day about the night meeting, and he said, the room filled with light, and he said, he was there, and he said, I didn't turn, I was just so awestruck, and he said, he was such a gentleman, because I was praying, but he didn't interrupt me, even though his presence was there, he waited till I finished, he said, I heard him say, T.L., I wanted to touch the people of Uganda, but I needed your hands. I wanted to come 
to this nation to heal, but I needed your feet. I wanted to speak to the people of Uganda, but I needed your mouth. And I just came today to say thank you for letting me use your feet, your hands, your mouth. Wow. The idea is that as badly as Christ wanted to bless the people, and I'm going to say something that may shock you theologically, but I have no doubt that Scripture totally backs me up. He could not do it because of what he has sworn. He has sworn to use people. It is God's manner to use people. That is our first M. Here's the second one. What God has done through us is a complete mystery. It is something that was not fully understood even by the writers of the Old Testament. The prophets of the Old Testament did not see this coming. They did not understand how it would fully happen. Even the 12 apostles did not get it. It was only afterward that they fully began to understand this mystery that God was going to work in the earth. And God had to bring up a special human being to reveal this mystery to the people it affected most. He had to raise up someone who had a thorough knowledge of the Old Testament. He wanted someone who was a scholar trained at the highest levels that knocks out the 12 apostles because they were called ignorant and unlearned men. They had wonderful men. They had a totally different purpose. I'll explain what it was in just a minute. But this guy had to be educated. The second qualification, and this is a strange one, he had to have somebody who was completely opposed to him. And he found such a man in Saul of Tarsus, a man who was thoroughly versed in the Old Testament, and at the same time, he hated Jesus' guts. But the fact that he would turn and follow Christ and bring with him this magnificent intellect and understanding of the Old Testament Scripture, he was perfectly suited to receive what was about to come. Now, I'm going to read from Ephesians chapter 3. This is our first venture into that chapter. Here's what he said in verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, he started out as Saul of Tarsus, he became Paul. It's a Roman name because he wanted to identify with his audience. So he said, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I have written briefly. Stop. Paul says, the things that I preach and the things that I will show you, I did not learn from people. He said, the things that I am introducing to you, this mystery that nobody knew or understood, he said, I got it by revelation. And then he explains in 2 Corinthians 12 and Galatians chapter 1 how that this thing that we call the gospel, he got it by being caught up to the third heaven and he was taught personally at the throne of God about what Jesus did. Now listen, the 12 had their purpose, but this was not their purpose. Their purpose was to explain everything that happened from the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan River by John all the way to the time that Jesus was caught up into heaven. So when Judas fell and they needed another apostle to take his place, that was the qualification. They said, we've got to have someone who followed Christ from the time he was baptized in the Jordan all the time that he was on the earth till he was taken up. And they found Matthew. He was the one they picked. Now, these guys had a mission. And their mission was to talk about what Jesus did in the earth. And so we see their witness. And it is recorded in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. So when this guy named Paul comes along, 
He doesn't repeat what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John have told us. There's no need for that. It's already been well covered for these guys. God's building a house, so he's doing four sides. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they have completely surrounded the house. Now we have a great look at all the things Jesus did, and all of them have a slightly different perspective. Same house, little different angle with every writer. But Paul comes and says, I'm going to show you what Jesus is doing now. Now, a lot of people don't know this. A lot of people think that Jesus is just resting, waiting till the second coming, basically doing nothing in heaven. He did all of his great work while he was here on the earth. Can I tell you that he has a job? He has a very serious job. First of all, he's the head of the church. If he's the head of the church, that means he's the one who gives the assignments. Do you realize that every missionary who gets a call from God to go to a foreign country, they are called by Jesus. He's the one who prepares and assigns that. Do you realize that every volunteer in every church who feels a burden to do this or that or the other, to work in children's ministry, youth ministry, to park cars, that is given by the head of the church? All of the people who preach, teach, some of us are great explainers, some of us are not explainers, some of us are great motivators, but all of those gifts come from Jesus. He is the head of the church, so that's his job. Secondly, he is the mediator or the high priest of this new covenant. Adam sinned one time and loses his whole place with God. Not so with us. We have someone to keep us connected to the Father at all times so that we are forgiven. And the minute we sin and ask God to forgive us, he steps in and says, Father, forgive them. And his blood is there to witness in heaven that the sin has been paid for. So he's the mediator of the high covenant. Now, the third job that he has, he's not fully into it yet. He is going to get into it in the not too distant future. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords, meaning that there will be a day when he is going to become the administrator of planet earth. What he's doing right now primarily is working on our behalf, but there is a day coming when the earth is going to get to know him, and they will know him as the lion of the tribe of Judah. They will also call him the lamb of God. A great t-shirt you might want to have is fear the lamb. Now, here is Paul explaining this, and he is saying that I was given this revelation of what he's doing now. So what the 12 apostles taught and what they showed us in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, according to the book of Hebrews, this would be called the milk of the word of God. And so when you first begin your walk with Christ, it's no wonder that what you're drawn to the most are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We wrap our minds around that. And we pretty much stay out of the epistles because they don't make a lot of sense to us. And since they were written by the apostle Paul, who uses 50, 60, 70 word sentences all the time with three or four parenthetical inserts in every sentence, sometimes it's a little bit hard to wrap your mind around That is the meat of the word. And you will have to spend a good deal of time in the milk before you can ever approach the meat. But this is what God has called us to. It is the mystery. And what is the mystery? Here's what Paul says. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the promise in Jesus Christ through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister. To me, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God. So that through the church, the many-sided, many-phased wisdom of God 
might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. What does that mean? Paul said what was hidden from all of the Old Testament prophets was the church. Isaiah didn't know it was coming. Never wrote about it. Nor did Daniel. Nobody in the Old Testament saw it coming. Paul said, I'm the one who revealed it to you. Even the 12 didn't get it. Jesus told them in Matthew 16, upon this rock I'll build my church, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Do they think about it? No. When they are with him on the Mount of Olives and he's going back to heaven, they said, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? What about the church? They don't care about the church. They're thinking Israel. Now they gradually changed because they started seeing what God was going to do through this new thing called the church. And on the day of Pentecost, they're saying, wow, there must be something else God's going to do here. And they're seeing the church begin to develop. But Paul comes along and says, let me tell you how this works. I saw it. And he explains this mystery. And it's an unthinkable mystery. That dirty, rotten, sorry, low-down, sinful, dirty people can be instantly cleansed of their sins and be made right with God and be put into this family with all the rights and privileges that once belonged only to those who were the strictest observers of Moses' law. And now Abraham is our Abraham. David is our David. All of the stories are ours. All of the covenants are ours. All of that work, that history, it now belongs to us. We have a heritage and a past because of Christ. He brought us into this amazing family, and it was a mystery hidden from the foundation of the world. Now, there's a little part here that I read that you didn't get. Let me read it again. So that through the church, the many-sided, many-phased wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Who are those guys? Demons, fallen angels, and Satan himself. In other words, they are now watching us go right from beneath them, over the top of them, and we are seated above them now in heavenly places. Years ago, we built this amazing thing out at Dry Gulch USA with your help, and the church did an amazing job called Christmas Train. And there was a season in 1996 where we had to haul all kinds of rock to put around that track, and, and we had to have a lot of concrete and so forth. And we had a county commissioner who didn't like us, and he sent us word that we could no longer have concrete trucks coming in to Drago Chusei, which is absolutely ridiculous. It just so happened that while he was saying this stuff, that the lieutenant governor of Oklahoma paid a visit to Drago Chusei. And we told the lieutenant governor about this edict that had come from the county commissioner, and she said, I'll speak with the governor. So the governor, Frank Keating at the time, got word of what was happening and said, you guys do what you need to do. So we had an edict from a local yokel, said you can't run your concrete trucks. But there was a guy who trumped him, who was the governor of the state, and he said, you do what you got to do to finish that project. We went with the higher authority. Are you with me? So there are some authorities in the atmosphere above us. They influence people the wrong way. That's why the bend of the world is headed in the wrong direction. It's because of the influence of those demonic powers. And what God did was something they never expected because they had always seen people as beneath them. And God had said to Abraham, I'm going to make your children like the dust of the earth. Well, they had no problem with that because the children of Israel were like the dust of the earth. God was not just talking about their number, although that was a part of it, but he was talking about their position. But then later, God speaks to Abraham and says, I'm going to make your children like the stars of the heavens. 
And it's not just about the number. It's about the position. And so God said to Abraham, you're going to have a seed that is, first of all, it will be all natural humans here on the earth. But then there will come a new phase where they will have a seat in the heavenly places. And now we are above. And Satan and all of those spirits have to watch while we carry out the wisdom of God. And listen to me. They don't have authority over you. No time, no time, no place in the Old Testament does anybody ever deal directly with the devil. God didn't say hardly anything about the devil in the Old Testament. You know why? Because God knows how humans are sometimes preoccupied with the devil. This happened with all of my kids. I would have people come to me in children's ministry training seminars, and they would say, Pastor Willie, can you help me? My little boy is four years old. He says he loves the devil. Yeah, my kids said the same thing. <clears throat> my boys especially, they would come to this phase where they heard about the devil, and they, I like the devil, Daddy. And I learned not to have a conniption fit. They're doing it just to dig it. It's just a kid thing. Are you with me? They didn't really love the devil. They just said that. All right? I like the bad guy. The bad guy is going to be my hero. Listen to me. They didn't deal with the devil directly. And God didn't say a lot about the devil because people would have begun to make offerings to the devil and they would worship the devil as it is the case in so many countries. When you look at all the gods that some of these people worship in other countries, look at their faces. They're all mean. Almost none of them are benevolent and kind. They're all mean. They got a frown, a scowl. They got horns. They're mad, and they give offerings to these kinds of guys. God doesn't want us to be preoccupied with the devil, so He waited till we would have a nature change, and then He seats us in the heavenly places. And now He tells us that we have authority over the devil. Four times in the New Testament, we are told to directly deal with the devil. Four times, meaning that we have a position above Him. Nothing he can do to stop it. And so the Apostle Paul is telling us then that this is the mystery that we have been raised up above principalities and powers. Years ago, I went out to get in the car in Wheeler, Texas to go home from church. It was my uncle's car. I lived with him. He and I were driving together. His wife had gone home early. She took my car. And so we were going to ride home together after church was all over. Only problem was my uncle's car was gone. So we walked all around the church, and we had a lot of practical jokers in our church, so we did a complete walk around the church. Nobody parked the car in the back end. Now, the reason why that might have been possible is because in 1972 in Wheeler, Texas, you didn't take your keys out of your car. You dropped them in the floorboard. Someone had stolen that car. Someone came by the church, started looking in the floor for cars that had keys, found ours, and took it. Needless to say, I was the one who drove that car to church that night, and I was the one who was in trouble because I left the keys in the car. Now, you know what I did? I thought, I, I'm responsible here, so I'm taking authority over the devil. I didn't pray to God because God wasn't the one who stole our car. The devil put somebody up to stealing our car. So I said, Satan, give it up now in the name of Jesus. I take authority over you. You inspired some human to take that car. I'm telling you, call it off now. I take authority over you. So the next day, we are scheduled to go to Fort Worth, Texas to a convention. And so my uncle and I get in my car to go to Fort Worth, Texas. We drive south toward Childress, Texas on Highway 83. We turn on 287 to go into Fort Worth. And about an hour west or east of Childress, I'm talking with my uncle. He's driving. I've got my back to the passenger window. And something comes over me, and I just turn and look. Whoa, 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 stop. And I point. And about a half mile down this tiny little farm-to-market road sits his car. So we drive down there, and sure enough, it is there, and the keys are in the floorboard. <laughs> and there's still a lot of gas in the tank. 
and I calculated how long it would take a person to drive that distance, and it was roughly the time that I would have prayed and said, give up the car. I don't know what the driver of that car saw. I don't know what came over him, but he was no longer able to keep going. That's authority over the devil. Now, he had to give it up. My brother came home from a softball game one night. He was all down about it, and I said, what happened? He said, somebody stole my glove, my nice glove. He said, it's gone. I said, let me tell you about a car. And I told him the story. <laughs> and so he took authority over the devil. Two weeks later, he's playing a softball game again, and at the end of the game, somebody left a glove in the middle of the outfield. He gets up, walks out there, and it's his glove. <laughs> Return to cinder. Listen to what I'm saying to you. We have authority over the devil. And we take authority over him stealing. And you don't need to let him run all over you. He needs to know you're the boss. God raised you up to demonstrate his many-sided wisdom to those guys. And I love what Miss Vessel Goodman used to do when she was here at our church and would preach. When she would talk to the devil, she'd turn and look down behind her. He's behind you and below you. And she'd say, do you hear that, Satan? She'd look down. We look up. No, don't look up. He may be up there, but you're seated above him. You look down when you talk to him. Give him the right perspective. Now, we have a manner. God uses people. We have a mystery. He created an amazing new entity called the church. But it's not enough yet. Because in order to do your thing, you must be empowered with his might. See, it's one thing to have all the information. It's another thing to be strengthened with might. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14. Here's a prayer Paul prayed. He said, for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Now, the word might is the Greek dunamahai, and it means inherent ability, ability to perform anything, to be possible, to be of power. That's what might is. So you can have the information and know what you need to do. That doesn't mean you're able to do it. When I was a sophomore in high school, I was playing a football game, and the kid across from me was whipping my tail every play. Man, I was frustrated, and I thought, I am going to get energized, and I ran out of the huddle and ran up there and looked across at him, and I said, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> Didn't work. He kept on killing me every play. We moved. Right after that season, we moved. Moved to Dallas. New high school, 2,600 students. Old town, 2,400 people. Old high school, 175 students. But this school was different. This school understood the will to prepare. See, a lot of people try to work through the will to perform. The will to perform is not enough. You must first have the will to prepare. And so this coach in the new school understood the importance of preparation, and he put us through a tremendous strength and conditioning program in the off season. So I started lifting weights, and I lifted weights when everybody else quit. I thought, if I quit when everybody else quits, then they're all on the same level as me. I've got to go beyond them. So I would stay in the weight room till 5 o'clock. Most everybody quit when the school day was over at 3, 3.15. Not me. I stayed till 5 o'clock. Coaches came and ran me out. That still wasn't enough. I would go home. My kid brother would come in from school. I would put my legs up in the bed, do push-ups, power push-ups on a slant, and have him sit on my shoulders. When he wasn't available, I would go down the hallway, stand on my head in the hallway, and go up and down on the wall and do push-ups vertically, reverse push-ups. I did all kinds of things. I couldn't do the president's physical fitness test and do 30 sit-ups before. I was doing hundreds of sit-ups. I would get in a place where I'd just keep going and keep going and keep going. Man, I was ripped. I did that for a whole year. And the next time I stepped on the football field, I never again looked at anybody ever and said, I'm going to kill you. I just did it.
I knew what I was supposed to do when I was a sophomore. There was a big problem. I could not do it. So you can have the idea, but without the spirit of might, you will never get it done. And so Paul says, you need to pray for the spirit of might for this cause. I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Might is the ability to pull things off. Now here is what happens. When you pray this prayer and begin to see the spirit of might work in you, in Ephesians 3, verses 20 and 21, this is what happens. Now unto him that is able to do all we ask or think, I wrong. Now unto him who is able to do above all we ask or think, I wrong. Now unto him that is able to do abundantly above all, we, are at, we can ask or think, I wrong. Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all, we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. My friends, it is when God begins to work through us that he is glorified the most. Heavenly Father, help us to catch this. Help us to be mindful of this. Help us to remember this prayer in Ephesians 3.14. Help us to make this a part of our belief system. And you're here or you're watching online, doesn't matter either place but you've never surrendered your life to Christ, pray out loud with me right now. Dear Heavenly Father, I surrender to the head of the church, to the King of Kings, to the mediator and high priest of this covenant of forgiveness. I confess Jesus Christ is my Lord. I believe you've raised him from the dead. With my mouth, I surrender. I thank you, Lord, for saving me. In Jesus' name, I am saved. Amen. Give him your praise and worship now. Thank you very much. Church on the Move, join me in thanking our founding pastor, Pastor Willie George. Just stay standing, just stay standing, that's fine. We're almost done. You know, one of the things that Pastor George drew out right in the middle of that text is that the gospel is about God inviting all of us into a family to experience life. And some of you this morning, you may have prayed that prayer of surrender, of acceptance of that gift for the very first time. There may be others of you in this room You accepted it a long time ago. You became a part of the family, but you've been away from home. Can I ask you to do something today? There are going to be people right down front here. If you prayed that prayer for the very first time, or if you've been a long way from the family, a long way from the Father, would you take a step more than just that prayer, would you come down when the service is over and, and, and pray with and talk to the people down here? Some of you may have questions. You're not quite ready to pray that prayer because there's some things that you don't yet understand. That's why these people are down here. They don't have all the answers, but, but we know where to find those answers. And we'll walk with you through that journey. No pressure. But don't just walk out of here and, and let the enemy, as Jesus said, take what you've heard, take what you felt, felt, and just snatch it away. Just jump right back into the routine of this week. Don't do that. Come forward. Pray with somebody. Others of you, may, you may have a prayer need. You got something going on at work. You got something going on with your family, your, your health. You got an issue there. You got a bad diagnosis. You need prayer. They're down here for that too. So step out. Some of you are in this room every single week and you think that's for the new people. That's for the people that are going through some major crisis. No, it's for you too. If you need prayer, 
Come down. That's why they're here. They want to pray with you when this service is over. Man, I'm so glad. I look at a full room like this. I'm so glad that we were able to spend time together as God's family today. Thanks for being here. I mean that. We finish our services with this blessing that comes out of the Old Testament, Numbers, the sixth chapter. We say it over ourselves and our families and over one another to set a tone for this week that no matter what the devil throws at us, we know we are blessed by the Creator and our Father God. So let's say this out loud together. The words are here on the screen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Thanks for being here and we'll see you next week.